Thank you, Sasha. Great to be back. So uh, I told you some work I did before on pushing this and massive stuff in the previous video, but today I will try to show some exciting new scenes uh, uh, again on the acquisition disk in different regimes. But uh, I'll try to start from the beginning, try to motivate and uh, decide to describe some basic numerical method that uh, what we use for these simulations. Feel free to interrupt and ask any questions if you seem unclear. Uh, okay, let, let's start from the, the basic idea. The basic picture is that uh, we were doing the simulations, but we are motivated by different uh, astrophysical systems that we have a lot of things in common. For example, the black hole efficient disk and the massive stars. And then for particular systems like X-ray boundaries and AGNs, and uh, the two of we use the idea of the equations plus the reading transfer that which I will describe to model the systems. And then normally we motivate to try to explain the existing observations. But uh, mo most frequently that you will discover new physics process that will be important. And that will what we want to do. At the end of the day, we can potentially use the simulations to calculate and predict all the observables with the light curve and the spectrum from the simulation directly, and then you can connect both the simulations and the observations directly. In many systems, the, 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 this kind of uh, approach will work, but uh, for today, I will more focus on black holes in AGNs and show one particular example how this approach will work and uh, help us to understand this particular system. I know a lot of you probably know the accretion disks, but uh, we can just start from the beginning. The accretion problem is actually very simple. It's uh, from an energetic point of view, it's just a material coming from the large distance and for the black hole, and uh, you just convert the gravitational energy to the radiation energy, which is what we see for these systems. It's very easy, but uh, of course the details matter. The big question that uh, we always try to understand uh, when you determine the properties of the equation disk, number one thing is the angular momentum transport. How do you actually transport the angular momentum out so that you can get material in? Of course, we know nowadays probably the magnetic rotational instability is doing most of the work. But that may not be true in all cases. And another big question is the, the dissipation, which is determine how you actually dissipate the gravitational energy to the thermal energy, particularly where you dissipate it. And that will be important later on when you determine like the relative contribution of the disk and the corona in the AGS. And of course, at the end of the day, you want to see the photons coming from the gravitation disk. And that is the question of transport that uh, how the photon you generate in the disk get out of the photosphere as you see. The question disk theory has been there for like for like more than 40 years, but there are still many, many puzzles that the, the classical thin disk model cannot explain very well. Obviously we do not understand the detailed physics process in these systems. I will just list a few I think it will be interesting part of that the, the simulations can answer now, but there are many more that uh, we'll need to understand. One particular thing that uh, has been there for decades is, uh, is basically the corona of the AGNs. From the classical equation disk theory, if you estimate the typical temperature from the optical thick disk, it will be for AGNs, supermass black holes like 10 to 8 or 10 to 6, so mass black hole, the disk temperature typically around 10 to 5K, 10 to 6K. So that is temperature range that uh, you explain the, like the big blue bump when you see the spectrum of AGNs. But often for most AGNs, you see a significant uh, energy in the X-ray band. Sometimes it can be more than half of the energy in the X-ray emissions. Well, how the X-rays are generated in the equation disks well, people already realize that uh, you can easily do that 
if you just put the hot electrons on top of the cold disk, and then you basically uh, condense scattering the thermal emission from the disk, and then, then you can make the extra photons. Well, that's the easy idea, but the real question is how do you actually form the corona with the accretion process so consistently, and how do you actually determine the fraction of power that you will put in the disk, and then you will put in the corona. That is very important, for example, you want to determine the retro contribution from the X-rays and the uh, opticals, and then to determine how the X-ray emission change with the like, black hole mass and the mass accretion rate. There are more interesting things that uh, we see for AGNs in the recent years, that it also requires to understand the basic properties of AGNs, uh, accretion disk. And one particular example I'm interested in is the so-called chain look AGNs. So this is a type of uh, time to move phenomenon that we see for AGNs now. <coughs> this is a particular four objects that are coming from Chelsea's paper. So what do you see for these AGNs that uh, in the, the, the one epoch we have the SDSS of vision for these AGNs. They are low luminous AGN and uh, without uh, broad, uh, uh, broad lines in the spectrum. But then after like a few years or 10 years time scales, we look at this object again with like both luminosity for this particular four AGNs show in this part is increased significantly. At the same time, the broad lines show up in the spectrum. In other words, if you're familiar with the AGN classification schemes, they can change types. I mean, typically, normally, we, we know the other unification mode of AGNs. It depends on your inclination angle. You will have type 1 or type 2. But this type, these AGNs are changing their types over like a 10 years time scales. And they can go both directions. Here, I will show four examples that are from low state to high state. But there are many other AGNs that go from the high state to low state, which means that when you see early on, they are more luminous and show the broad lines. But after a few years, 10 years, they can be much uh, luminous just, and then the broad lines are gone. These are also puzzling, of course, uh, we talk to people working on TDEs, they will say though that TDEs can explain the time domain behavior of the AGNs, but this, which is, I think, very unlikely when you see the AGNs going both directions in these time scales. And uh, more recently, there could other observation of change look AGNs can do this in a few year time scales. And the people are probably thinking that something in the disk is actually causing this. Well, that is the question we try to understand what what the disk is doing actually to make this happen. Yes. Um, I, I don't know much about higher destruction events. Like, why do you say it's unlikely that the T is causing these changing um, broad lines? Yeah, the one well, thing is the time scale. Typically, the TD show up like in the months, and uh, typically you see TD go like go up and then decline. These change look agents uh, can go, of course, sometimes can go up. I mean, it's deeper, but sometimes they can be already bright and then they're deeper for like 10 years, which is very unusual for typical TDs, we think. Unless you unless you make the TD model flexible enough, you tune the parameters, you may do that, but uh, that is very unlikely for all the change look agents at the cost of uh, variability properties of agents. Okay, so that is a a few, I think, are most interesting motivations to understand better the property of the accretion disk AGNs. Of course, when you talk about the radiation, the Earth radiation is not only important for what you see, it actually controls the dynamics in many systems. And one classical limit is if you reach the Einstein limit. So that is the regime that the force of the radiation on the protons is actually balances the force of gravity. And in this regime, the radiation is actually play an important role to determine all the dynamic properties of systems. And uh, 
for one particular, like for black holes, I just want to emphasize, I want to give you this idea of the typical parameters. If you just take the energy luminosity, which you know for electron scattering alone, if you take the 10 to, uh, 10 to 6 or 10 to 8 uh, thermal spark code for AGNs, you will roughly get the temperature like 10 to 5K. That's what you expect if you just uh, take all the energy luminosity to be black body emission with the surface area around the event horizon, basically. If you take that to the band, actually boundaries, which is only like 10 solar mass spectral, also, mm -hmm. the temperature you naturally get like 10 to 7K, which is what you see for the actually boundary disk. <coughs> Normally, when people do MD simulations, everything is scale free. You just do one simulation and use that to explain all the things you see, <laughs> which I will argue is not true if you actually consider the radiation so consistently. And uh, the fact they have quite different temperature and density regimes means there are many more things showing up in AGNs, which I will, I will show later. Of course, when I, the title is the application to all astrophysical systems, the uh, important radiation is not only true for efficient disk, it's also very important actually for massive stars as an example. For example, if you just take the typical 1D slightly evolution for the zero age main sequence stars, because the luminosity increase rapidly with the mass, when you typically go to like a hundred of mass of star, for example, you can easily get the uh, antenna ratio more than 50% in the envelope. When you actually consider evolved stars after the mean sequence, like typical wolf ray stars, we can easily reach the antenna limit like more than 75%. Again, this is an antenna limit for electron scattering alone. If you consider all the other passages, you can easily super antenna. And that makes all the radiation playing an important role to determine what you see for many like luminous variables or the property of outflow from the wolf ray stars. I will not talk about the massive stars. I just want to mention that the radiation is also important for these other, many, many other systems. That's a brief motivation that the why we care about the radiation when you do all these simulations. But the tool we want to use when you do simulations is a very simple. <laughs> Basically, the MD equations to in describe the gas of the <coughs> like any systems that you want to study. Of course, you want to do magnetic field because you want to do the MRI for the angular moment transport, particularly for efficient disk. And the new thing that particularly appears important low in all the work that I have done in the doing the radio transport in 3D, again to determine the thermal properties of the system so consistently, and also <coughs> capture all the dynamics when the radiation pressure is uh, important compared with gravity, basically. Uh, I know you're all doing some kind of numerical related. You all have equations, right? I just show you the basic <laughs> equation that uh, you are more, most of you are familiar with, basically. Again, in the, the <laughs> left-hand side, the basically the idea of the equations, which describe the evolution of the mass, the momentum, and the energy, the new thing that when you couple the radiation, the real thing that uh, determines the momentum of the radiation and the energy, which is described the heating and the cooling from the radiation. But that is not a given. In order to determine the momentum source term and the energy source term, you actually need to solve the radiation transport equation so consistently. And the new thing that uh, when we say to actuate the radiation dynamics, we do solve the specific intensity directly over discrete angles. Of course, that is the fundamental quantity to describe the transport of the photons. And uh, this is the, this looks very simple. It's basically the transport equation. And then you have a source terms. In the commuting frame, you have source terms describe the absorption and the emission. And the simple case, if you assume LTE, that's what it looks like and also scattering. Scattering, for example, electron scattering. Describe how you distribute the photons of discrete angles. <coughs> it looks quite simple, but it really <coughs> makes the simulation much more expensive compared to the classical community equations. The number one thing that uh, the, in the traditional MT equations, you only have one density 
three moment um, 100 that they are three magnetic field but specific intensity are function of angles not only time and space and typically you will need uh, for example in all the 3d simulations like 80 <coughs> angles per cell and that immediately makes the transport equation much more expensive because you just need to store more specific intensity more angles and there are many other issues when you solve the transport equation. The, the transport equations change their behaviors depends on whether you're in the upper thick or the thin regimes. If you are in the upper thin regimes, basically, if you, for example, forget about the force terms, this is very easy. This, this just have body equations describe the transport of the intensity. But if you're in the upper thick regimes, you basically will go to the diffusion limit. That is not have a body equations. So you actually need a numerical method if you want to do this uh, accurately to handle the change of the type of equations in different regimes and make sure you do it correct, particularly in the transition regimes. And another difficult comes from the thought terms when you describe the absorption and the scattering, you typically in many simulations, like in the inside the force sphere, you may not resolve the photon mean free pass. And that will actually suggest that uh, you have, will have very short time scales for summarization, for example. The time scale will be much, much shorter compared with the typical time step you take in all the simulations. And that is uh, will require to basically handle a stiff systems in the language or numerical, numerical technique. For the last uh, issue, when you solve this transport equation, that uh, photon transport with speed of light. Speed of light, uh, unless you are close to a black hole, for many systems like uh, massive stars or other galaxy simulations, speed of light is the uh, speed is uh, much, much faster compared with other typical velocity you have in your system. So you need to have a way to handle these uh, large separations of the uh, velocities. And that's all the issues that uh, we can we can, we can figure out how to do in, when you do the radiation and simulations. Probably the last, this is the last slide talking about the pneumatics. If you're not interested in this, uh, I, will, I will go to the results after this. But the, the end of, at the end, of what we do is that uh, we basically develop the new method since my PhD to the gym, and I continued after my PhD to solve the radiation MD equations to satisfy all the conditions you have and uh, fix all the issues I mentioned. And that is able to couple the energy and the momentum of the radiation and the gas accurately in both upper thick and upper thin regimes. And that is uh, what makes possible to do all the projects. And all these, uh, although I say it's able to do it, but still very, very expensive simulations. And we need to get a lot of uh, national computer time every year in order to do the simulations that I will show you. So I would, I would just, this is just a, a list of uh, some of the projects I have done, and that uh, includes not only accretion disk, that is a big part that I have done in the past years for different accretion rate, but uh, as I mentioned, they also used to model the envelope of the massive stars, particularly the luminous blue variables, and uh, we also used to study the the outflow from the ultraluminous extra, uh, from the Euros and also the TDEs. The many other projects, <clears throat> I do not have time to go through that. When you do the radiation filter <coughs> flows, do you yes. put it, I still notice Proger's name there. Do you do the uh, line blocking or just uh, just electron scattering? Well, Daniel is here, yes. That is, uh, but we are not doing the lines. The line transport is much, much more difficult. So we're just doing the radiation for a particular project to do it with a dust, actually. So it's not an electron scattering opacity, it's a dust opacity that are coupled to the uh, gas and the radiation. But the lines are probably most important for driving the BAL winds, right? Depends on the type of wind that you are thinking. For the for the outflow in the uh, equation disk that Daniel studied, 
the, the lines probably will play an important role. But for many systems like the, the users, the basic stuff for machine gases, we do not think the line between the, the world. Okay. Right, in the rest of the talk, I will just focus on some of the most recent work that they have done for black emission disks and uh, try to demonstrate how these simulations can be used to discover some new physics that we think will be interesting. Before I go to the detailed results of simulations, I just mentioned that the typical setup that we do the black emission <coughs> disks, there are no lines for these simulations. Because uh, we, uh, we've tried to focus on the one in the region of the disk. The most uh, radial range for the first few simulations I will show is going from like uh, uh, six quotation radii to maybe go to, let's say, like 30 quotation radii. And for the other simulations I will show, go from 30 quotation radii to 100 quotation radii. The typical simulation was to, because we do not know how you actually feed the gas in AGS. You may know if you go to a more larger scales, but uh, for the type of simulation we are doing, we just put the torus in the outer region at the initial uh, field and put some weak magnetic field. And then the MI will work and drive the accretion to the black hole. Initially, there's nothing inside the region that we are interested in. But the once the gas get there, it will form a disk so consistently. We will determine for what accretion rate it will achieve, and then the spatial structure or the density, temperature, radiation, magnetic field. What do you use as an initial configuration for magnetic field? Yeah, we, we tried the, the most important thing in the configuration, the shape of the magnetic field, we tried two types. The one type is so-called the uh, single loop. So what it means is that you have a single row magnet field, you have a net product magnet field just uh, through the disk. That is the one type. The other another type is that you have multiple loops on the one half of the disk and the other loop on the on the other half of the disk, but there are no net product magnet field. That is the most important parameter for the initial magnet field. And the typical ratio between the magnet pressure and the thermal pressure is like 10% or so for the initial condition, not a weak magnetic field. But does it matter what initial, I guess I'm asking, does it matter what initial condition you use or what happens afterwards? I will show you. So the structure of the disk, you will change depends on the configuration, whether you have a net product magnetic field or not. But some properties do not. But that is the part I will, you will ask about exactly what I'm trying to show. What is the property that is unique when you change the magnetic field configurations? But the, it probably does not depend on the initial strength of magnetic field. Because the, otherwise, the weak magnetic field to start with, the MRI will amplify the magnetic field quickly. So even your initial weak magnetic field is a little bit different, but you end up in a very similar saturation state. How much of the amplification you're actually seeing when you're starting like the percent? That is nothing I'll show you. It could end up uh, to magnetic pressure compared to thermal pressure, or even not. Yes. I'm sorry, Yanfei, it's very hard to read. What is, what is the inner and outer boundary in gravitational radii? Yeah, so this for this particular round, first round, the inner boundary is actually 4 RG. Okay. And for the outer boundary, we only reach a slight set maybe 20 or 30 RG. Okay, okay, thank you. For the other simulations I will show near the end, the inner boundary will move from 4 to 30 RG actually. Uh -huh. And then we go all the way to 100 RG. And the technique, uh, again, if you're interested in numerical techniques, uh, in order to solve the full global structure disk, uh, we have to use a mesh refinement. It's simply because in the disk, uh, a lot of action is happening near the mid-plane, so we put uh, more resolution near the mid-plane. But still, we want to cover the whole picture of the disk uh, so you can capture like the outflow, so you have a low resolution all the way to extend uh, to the uh, larger distance. At the end of the day, the highest resolution we achieve for this simulation is almost go to 1,000 cubic. That is actually a lot in terms of uh, 3D simulation, and that's why it's expensive. Remember, this is just a spatial resolution. And if you multiply like 80 angles, that really is the amount of uh, variables you have to solve for these simulations. 
The one big thing I think will actually the new thing that uh, will be important for AGN disk is opacity. So you were all familiar with the electron scattering, and that is the dominant opacity in the classical disk models. And I already mentioned that if you actually ask me the typical temperature and density for AGNs, the typical temperature is only 10 to 5K. And we all know for people who work on stellar structures, if you just use uh, <coughs> solar metallicity and plot the loss and mean opacity, which is the opacity that you need when you couple the momentum of the photon and the gas, as a function of temperature, each line for a fixed density, around this temperature, around the 2 times 10 to 5K, you have a bound opacity due to the ion elements. That can be a factor of few larger compared to electron scattering. This is basically electron scattering. If you go to lower temperature, like a, a few times 10 to 4K, you can, depends on the density you are, you can have opacity a factor of 10 or 20 larger than electron scattering, which is due to the heliums. And then you can even larger, you can go to the 10 to 4, which is due to the hydrogen, and then you have a, a drop <coughs> below the 10 to 4K. This is a really new thing that people haven't explored, how these opacity will actually affect the structure of the DSK in AGNs. Because AGNs, typical density and temperature are in the right regimes, at least in the, in the order of magnitude. Of course, you want to determine accurately where all this opacity will show up and how that will affect dynamics. That is the goal of the simulations. Okay, so that is the basic uh, setup for the simulations I will show you for AGNs. Then the, I will just uh, summarize a few really new things that uh, we learned from simulations. And that is uh, quite different compared with the classical thin disk model that we are all familiar with. So the first thing, two simulations I will show you is uh, for two simulation reaching about 7% of the antenna accretion rate and another simulation reach about 20% of the antenna accretion rate all the way to the inner region of the, of the black hole. This is the typical the accretion rate regimes that, that we see for most AGNs. <coughs> most AGNs uh, you, you, uh, in the sub antenna regimes. But the disk looks quite different compared with what you are familiar in the classical <coughs> disk picture. But what I'm showing here is the time and the azimuthally average from the 3D data showing the structure in terms of radius and the height. <coughs> the left panel showing the color of the density and the streamline the uh, flow velocity. In the right panel, the color showing the radiation density and the streamline showing the magnetic field. Of course, what, when the first thing you notice is that the disk is thicker when you go to high accretion rate. That is what you, what do you expect? In the 20% of the antenna accretion rate case, you will see more like classical disk. You have a high temperature near the mid plane and it drops to the outer part. But that is not the case when you go to 7% antenna accretion rate. The radiation and density is almost uniform <coughs> across the regimes. Yes? So when you set up the initial torus, yes. so what are the properties of these initial torus that determine whether you end up in the high any integrator versus the low integrator. The proper density. The, the, only density. Thing, the only thing we change because the, the free family in the torus is how much mass basically you put there. You keep the shape of the torus the same, but when you put a high dense, higher density of the initial torus, you will end up with a higher mass accretion rate. Mm -hmm. The mass accretion rate is not controlled by us. You just measure the accretion rate of what you get after the disk is formed. If you put a lower mass of the torus, then you will form the lower mass accretion rate case. Yes, Jared. This is a very hypothetical question. Of course, you're doing it the right way with MHD. But suppose you had taken the simple approach of doing it with an alpha viscosity, but did a 3D simulation with an alpha viscosity. Yes. Would it be similar or different from this? It would be totally different. I will, I will, I will, I will try to explain to you what is the difference for the radiation dissimulation compared with the alpha disk model. Yeah, okay. I haven't finished. This is just the beginning. <laughs> <laughs>
it will be totally different. Uh, but the one thing that will be different uh, compared with, particularly with this case, <coughs> the fact that the radiation is almost uniform in this case already suggests that the, the open depth is much smaller for this equation rate compared with the upper test model. I will explain why that is the case. Okay. But so with the radiation, it's also the ray tracing is adaptive as well, or it's just the, the grid to follow the hydro? The, the, the specific intensity follows the spatial resolution automatically. Okay. So the spatial resolution is the same for gas and radiation. Okay. Yeah, the radiation just a, have additional angular resolution. Is yes. the grid a nested grid or an adaptive grid? It's a static. Yeah. It's a static grid, not a, a, a adaptive. Yeah. This is a, enough for this simulation because we know, you know where we want enough. the high resolution. Yes. 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 You will order like what is from uh, yeah. 1 to 100. I will, I will show you exactly the upper depth. So, in terms of like if I want the simpler method, for example, a lower optical depth, like from 1 to 10, like if I just do Monte Carlo for photons. And estimate all the moments to close the MHD equations. Like how how bad that would be? If you do Monte Carlo for radiation, you do not close the MHD equations. You close the radiation equations. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, but then you can compute uh, you know fluxes and everything and use them in the hydro equations. Yes, yeah, so the Monte Carlo equations. The the question that uh, will be Monte Carlo is good for the near optical field regimes ish. It will be very slow if you go to high optical depths. I mean, it will be very bad at optical depths of 100, but at optical depths of 5, I expect. Yeah, the disk, what the, you will find is that the density is lower when you go to the inner region. So that is the order of unity. And then you will, if we go to a larger distance, you will go to like 100. If you go to torus, you go to 4, 5. If you do Monte Carlo, you basically cannot do anything with the torus. Monte Carlo, of course, you have much noise there. No one knows uh, how the noise will affect the movement and coupling. Well, the color is okay if you want just to solve a heating and cooling. But in the radiation pressure down regimes, uh, Monocaro, you probably need a very high, what, a large amount of Monocaro package to reduce the noise. But if you actually try to come, you should let yeah, I want to Sorry. hear what Yang Fei has to okay. tell us. Yeah, maybe we can <laughs> defer technical questions until. Sure. Uh, yes, the, the most interesting result is the comet. So, so, the, the, <laughs> so you can estimate the time, and the more interesting that the, for the radiation MG simulations, you can actually calculate the light curves. So this is unlike at MG equation, you only know the mass equation rate. But you can actually estimate the light curves from the two simulations. The one important difference if you have two different magnetic configurations, whether the two simulations have different magnetic configuration. They actually show different variability patterns when you look at the light curves. That will be interesting to compare with observed light curves. But the number one difference, I will say the big difference is that the, the disk is actually end up to support it by magnetic field, not by the thermal pressure. So that is the one difference. If you just look at the shear average, means that you average all the pressure at every height. The magnetic pressure is comparable to the radiation pressure or then. Of course, in all the AGN simulations, the gas pressure is tiny. As you can see from this curve, it's like a three order magnitude smaller. But if you actually look at the vertical structures, which is I'm showing here, the vertical profile density, different pressure component, maximum stress and uh, uh, notation velocity and radial velocity, the Radiation pressure is almost a constant. As you see, you get a strong gradient of the magnetic pressure. And that is the actually determined balance of gravity in the vertical directions. If you simply do alpha this model, there's no magnetic pressure, then you will end up to a much stronger thermal pressure in the middle in order to balance the gravity. You will get a quite different uh, spatial structure at first. <coughs> And then one more immediate difference if you have this magnetic pressure support disk is that uh, you end up with a lower surface density for the same mass equation rate compared with the gas pressure supported disk. So that is what I'm calling the optical depth the pro for the two simulations. The black line is the radio profile of the total loss and mean optical depth, and the dashed line is the optical depth for effective absorption. 
for the low efficiency case, when you go to the inner region of this, upper diameter is only affect uh, two or so, and then the increase to 100 at uh, uh, the uh, out, out region of the disk. Of course, the, the surface density is larger, the upper depth is larger for the high efficiency rate, now you can go to like 1,000. Particularly interesting that the, for the low efficiency rate, seven percent also, you actually become of your theme for effective absorption, actually. So that means your photon is actually not have entirely summarized for this part of the disk, for this equation rate. That actually will affect the spectrum you expect from this disk. At the same time, the lower surface density, if you compare with the classical alpha disk model, you can construct the same equation rate. You will be smaller by at least a factor of few, like four or five. And that is the basically property of magnetic support. You have much more extended and you have a larger radial velocity, and which it requires low surface density for stem acceleration rate. And the other more fundamental difference compared with alpha disk model. And then another important difference is the surface accretion. In the alpha disk model, of course, every scene accreted near the midplane. But if you look, really look at the simulations, what you can do is you just calculate total mass accretion rate across all the height. M dot will roughly a function is a constant of function radius. That is just indicate you reach a steady state out to a certain radial range. But sometimes you can separate the amount of mass accretion rate according to the photosphere. You can calculate the amount of M dot the outside the photosphere and the inside the photosphere. So what you actually find that in this magnetic pressure support disk, uh, more than half of the accretion happen above the photosphere when you have like 7% of the accretion rate. While for the 20% case, then actually more, more accretion happens inside the photosphere. And that makes uh, a lot of difference uh, compared with the accretion classical or optics model, because if you actually accrete in the optical thin region, you are not able to actually summarize your emissions. The efficiency of your job, but sometimes you will create a corona. That's what I will show you uh, after this. And more fundamentally, if you care, really care about the physics in the equation, what is driving the equation in the disk? In the alpha disk model, of course, everything is alpha. The stress is just a proportion of the pressure, thermal pressure. And the, of course, it will be the dominant near the midplane. But if you really look at the the moment equation, couple the gas and the uh, radiation, of course, the, the choice you have for angular moment transfer, which is the Reynolds stress, come from the low weight <coughs> term, and the Maxwell stress, the gas pressure seems to be astrobic, that will not transport angular moment term. But the other radiation pressure, radiation pressure is really a tensor. So in principle, the radiation stress can also transport the angular moment term. But in most cases, that is very small because the radiation momentum is not significant. But if you really look at these AGN simulations, so what you find that uh, if you plot the spatial structure, shear average of radiation stress, both the R theta component and the phi theta phi component, and you compare with the metal stress in the left and the Reynolds stress, what you see is that the near the mid plane, the metal stress and Reynolds stress is definitely dominant. But once you are above the photosphere, you have a significant uh, radiation stress showing up. <coughs> if you actually do the shear average, the total radiation stress is actually larger than total mass stress and renal stress. This is like pointing Robertson drag, this type of effect. It's a radiation viscosity. I, 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 will, I, will, I will show you after this. It's really because of the sh shear between the photosphere and the disk. So the radiation viscosity, radiation stress, I mean, people propose uh, actually as a possible way in the past, but it was basically neglected. And simply because the radiation viscosity, if you're in the classical formula, proportion of the radiation density and the optical depth in the bottom, and this is the velocity shear. The radiation viscosity, what it really means that uh, you have one fluid element emit photons. It can be isotropic uh, in the fluid rim. But if the other relative shear between the fluid elements, when the nearby fluid element absorbs the photons, 
is no longer isotropic in the fluid frame of the new fluid, in the right frame of the new fluid element, then you will feel a, a force when you absorb the photons. In basically, the requirement for the radiation viscosity to be important will be a large radiation density and the relatively low upper depth. That explains why the radiation viscosity show up near the first sphere, because that is the region of <coughs> the upper depth of the unity. And it show up for the AGN simulations because you have a huge radiation density compared with the gas pressure. And the velocity shear basically is causing by the rapid accretion at the first sphere and the slow accretion near the disk. And that creates a natural place for the velocity shear to be able to uh, respond for the viscosity. And even better, at the pneumatical simulation, of course, you do not ch just trust anything you come from the code. You can actually check the outcome of the radiation viscosity with the classical analytical formula. And what you find, this I'm plotting the vertical profile of the, the pneumatical calculated viscosity and the, the formula, it basically roughly agrees. And that is a good try that the code is actually doing the right thing. And another important thing is the corona. If you just look at the gas temperature of the two simulations, because you have a significant dissipation in the optical thin regions, once you dissipate energy in the optical thin region, the gas cannot cool efficiently, then you basically heat up. And the more of dissipation you have in the optical thin region, the more corona you will get. Basically, what you find that for the low efficient rate, you have a large volume of corona with the temperature go to like 10 to 8 to 9K. For the high efficient rate case, because the optical depth is moved up to the higher height, you have less volumes, but it's more concentrated to the rotation axis of the disk. And that is actually pretty consistent with what we see between the ratio like optical emission from the AGNs and X3. Normally, people see that the, the ratio between the optical emission and X3 will decrease when you go to high accretion rate. And that can be easily understood by the simulations simply because when you go to high accretion rate, the amount of optical thin dissipation you have is reduced. And then you get a lower fraction of the corona emissions. And we can also calculate the spectrum. I will, I will skip that. But I'll come back to the most interesting part. Uh, I think that is a still ongoing work in the last maybe uh, five minutes. So the idea is that uh, the previous simulations, we put all the simulation domain to the one inner region of the back hole simply because it's limited by the computation power we have. But in those regions, the temperature is too high and density is typically too low compared with the classical alpha disk model. And the classical ion opacity, we estimate, does not show up in those regimes. But we, know, we all know that when you go to a way, far away from the black hole, the density will increase, the temperature will drop. The interesting thing to ask is that uh, is there any radio regimes that the uh, ion opacity will actually show up and change the structures? And that is what we are doing for this uh, set of simulations. The idea is very simple. You basically move the simulation domain to a larger distance. <coughs> now for these simulations, you have the inner region is about like 30 precession radii, and then the outer region you can reach, let's say, maybe 200 precession radii. And one thing you see immediately from the this movie, which shows the evolution of the density as mutually average, is that actually you see the disk show a very interesting oscillations. When the material goes to this region and form a disk, with time going on, sometimes the disk uh, puffed up, and then it tends to actually try to collapse, but then it does not die completely. And doing the oscillations in the uh, the typical thermal time scale around this region. One thing you can check after the simulation is done is immediately is that if you just plot the loss of mean opacity, a function of spatial positions, and compare with the electron scattering value. So this is a ratio between the loss of mean opacity in the code and the electron scattering value. Anything about why in the location when you have uh, enhanced opacity. And you can see in all the disk regions, you get uh, enhancement of opacity at least a factor of few. You can easily go to a factor of 10. 
So this is the location that uh, this is additional opacity is actually significant. And more important, uh, this additional I opacity, because of the dependence of the opacity on temperature and density, create actually very rich radiation hydronic phenomenon. Actually, one type of thing that we think is happening is basically the carbon mechanism that we are familiar with in stars. But what happens is that uh, when the disk uh, collapses, for example, if you look at the history of the surface density at the 10 gravitational radii, when the surface density drops, when the disk cools, if you only have electron scattering, the total over that is just proportional to the surface density. But because of the additional opacity dependence on temperature and density, when you cool, the opacity increases further compared with what you expect from electron scattering. So the total orbit depth increase much larger. And that basically increases the uh, uh, thermal time scales for the photon to escape. And that will shut down the cooling of the disk and make the disk uh, uh, puff up again. But when the disk actually puff up and become hotter, the orbital depth is jumps further. And that makes the cooling time scale much shorter compared to what you expect. And that created basically the oscillations of the disk. This is basically the same as the carbon mechanism in stars. It's just that we haven't never thought this in the equation disk. And this is creating basically the oscillation of both the luminosity and the accretion rate in the thermal time scales in this region. And guess what? Thermal time scales for this region is around like 10 years. That is the typical time scale for like 10 to 8, the thermal mass of black hole. And this could be a potential way to cause the variation we see, for example, the trend look eight years without the changing the mass accretion rate from other distance. Yes, Jerry. Is it hot enough so that all the iron grains are destroyed? Not that hot. So the, the variation of the- in many environments, most of the iron is locked up in grains. This is in the upper thick of the disk. So the temperature will vary from like uh, 10 to 5 to like 3 to 5. The density for this typical like 10 to minus 8 to 10 to minus 10 rack per cubic centimeter. So we are assuming that the, the ions are fully coupled with the gas. And that is actually very good assumptions because that is also the parameter regime for the deep <coughs> angle of stars people have modeled for decades. That's enough to destroy the grains. They're going to stutter pretty fast at those densities. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, the variation of temperature is enough to change the opacity. Okay. Because, yeah. uh, because the, the, the opacity is pretty sensitive to the temperature. And also the pretty strong density dependence. So not only the ions, actually the heat opacity is also significant here. So you're you worried about solid grains, dust. Well, not, yeah, no, well, not, well, not the cold for that, well, not that cold, I think, for the dust. The, typically, we worry about the dust regime in like a thousand K or hundred K. That that's not in the opposite part of the disk. Uh, this is still ongoing. I haven't uh, fully completed the story yet, but I think that is uh, again is showing the interesting that could happen once you actually include this new physics in the cushion disk simulation so consistently. Uh, so that that all the exciting things that I think uh, we have for the accretion disk simulations. But uh, if you look at the future, there are many, many more things that can be done with all the all the tools that we have. Obviously thing that if you want to do lines, it's actually quite difficult simply because the, the Doppler shift will cause you strongly frequency dependent. And you will need a very high frequency resolution to do that in these schemes. It will be much easier to do Monte Carlo, actually. But still, if you want to distinguish like the infrared photons, optical photons, X-ray photons, you can easily do multi-group frequency dependent transport. That is doable. But that is actually one thing that uh, we're working on can extend the module for that. 
And the other, you can do the retransfer in, in full general relativity. And that is also, uh, we have the actually the equations actually to solve that. And there are many other development for this type of numerical scheme. You can do cosmic transport. We're also doing some new schemes to do thermal conduction for other projects that uh, I'm interested in. But once you have the tool, you can use this to explore the property of the equation disk more much wider equation rate, and also for a very different radial range of the disk, and just to understand the, the properties uh, in both like actually binaries and the ATNs. I'm recently more interested in the try to understand the type of equation disk in what it compacts so called MCVN systems. This is a system that you can actually model the inflow from the gap from the one point all the way to the surface of the white dwarf. And that is a, a natural place that you can compare the equation disk theory with equations. And again, there are more things to, to be done for the angle of the massive stars to understand the property of the LB ways and understand the origin of the high mass loss rate, like the warp ray stars. And uh, the cosmic transport is also interesting for many properties of the, the, the in star mediums. So that is also something that I'm, most, uh, I'm working on. Right, so I think I'm out of time. I just leave the summary of what I have talked about here and uh, happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you.